Hi everyone and welcome to our summary PowerPoint about genetic variation. What we're going to be doing in this video is having a look at two parts of the specification, 6.1.2a part 1, contribution of both environmental and genetic factors to phenotypic variation, and 6.1.2a part 2, how sexual reproduction can lead to genetic variation within a species. First thing we need to understand then is a couple of definitions. Now these should be familiar to us from GCSE, phenotype and genotype. Whenever we're talking about the phenotype, this is the physical characteristics, the actual appearance of that organism. So this would be something like brown hair. So you can see it, it's that physical characteristic, that is the phenotype. The genotype are referring to the alleles that are present within the organism. So it's basically what alleles actually lead to that particular characteristic. So phenotype is the physical characteristic, the genotype are the alleles present within the organism itself. When it comes to the actual causes of this phenotypic variation in organisms, there are three we need to know about. Genetic factors only, environmental factors only, and a combination of the genetic and environmental factors together. So if we start off then with the genetic factors, one of those key things we need to consider here is mutation. Hopefully we remember the definition for mutation is a change in the base sequence of the DNA but it could also refer to a change in the number or the structure of chromosomes. So this is where we're now starting to diverge from our GCSE knowledge just a touch. Now, one of the things that we will find actually increases the risk of an organism having a mutation is their exposure to these things we call mutagens. And quite simply, a mutagent is just some kind of a chemical, biological, physical agent that increases the rate that will occur of mutations. So in terms of some examples of these mutagens, then the physical ones, these will be some that are familiar to us from our GCSE physics knowledge, X-rays, gamma rays and ultraviolet. So obviously X-rays, that's why they're going to ask you how many X-rays you've had when you go for one at the hospital. Gamma rays, generally something we should limit our exposure to. And UV, ultraviolet. Hence the reason that if you are one of those people who insists on crisping yourself in the sun every time it pops out or spend their life lounging around on a sunbed, then chances are you are more likely to develop skin cancers as you get older because you've increased your exposure to ultraviolet radiation and therefore increased the risk of mutations taking place. The second category, the chemical versions. So if we do a little bit of a history knowledge here, so any of you who did history in the past, then mustard gas, which we can see in the little picture there, this is actually a chemical that, while unpleasant in itself, also increases the risk of mutation in an organism. We also have a couple of other more A-level chemistry related answers there we could give, reactive oxygen species and the aromatic amines, so group of chemicals there. And the last group, the biological ones, certain viruses can increase the risk of mutation, as can these things called transposons. Now a transposon is basically the remains of viral nucleic acid that's been incorporated, so it's become part of our actual genome there. So all of these are just examples of mutagens. You don't have to recall numbers of them. I'd suggest you just remember physical, chemical, biological, an example of each, and you'll be absolutely fine. So when it comes to these mutations, then at GCSE, we'd have looked at three different categories, if you like, of mutation. The neutral ones, no benefit, but no harm to the organism. They just are. Tongue rolling, for example. You are not more likely to survive if you can roll your tongue, but you're also not more likely to die. You can just do it or not. Option two, that they are beneficial to the organism, so they confer some kind of survival advantage to it. And option three, that they are harmful, so there is some kind of a negative impact on that organism through the presence of that mutation. 
In order to upgrade this to A level, what we need to do is think about where these mutations are taking place. So we've got two options to us really here. We could have mutations in the normal body cells, or we can have mutations in the gametes. So gametes are sex cells, if you remember. Now, if we've got a mutation in just one of our regular body cells, then this actually has quite limited impacts. Whereas a mutation in gamete formation are what we term persistent and random. Now, if we think first of all about the persistent part there, what we're referring to is that they can actually be passed on through many generations. So what we find here is rather than just affecting that one organism that had the mutation, that's going to be passed on through them to their offspring, to the offspring's offspring, and so on. So what we see here is that mutation is persistent. It's going to be there for several generations at least. And the second part, the random, this basically is just referring to the fact that it's not based on need. So what we actually find here is that these mutations that are occurring, it's not driven by giving this organism some kind of an advantage. It just happens. It could happen anywhere. It could be doing anything. So persistent and random, these are the problems we find with the mutations in our gametes. What we're now going to do is move on to this new idea, if you like, at A level, the idea that we can have mutations within the chromosome. It's not just a change in the base sequence of the DNA, but there can also be alterations to the chromosomes during meiosis. And what we're going to do is we're going to take each of the different mutations of the chromosomes in turn to see what happens in each case. So the first one, a deletion. As the name suggests, this is where part of the chromosome is basically lost. So quite clearly, if we've got our chromosome and then we've lost a bit of it, whatever genes were present on that particular section that is now no more have been lost. It could also be that there are certain regulatory sequences in there. So what we find there is you've either lost a gene completely or we've lost the ability to regulate a gene that's still present. So deletion is problematic for us. Option two, inversion. Now, if we invert something, we're basically flipping it. So here, a bit of the chromosome has broken off. It then rotates by 180 degrees and then it rejoins that same structure. Now, the issue with this, we're not losing any genes. The genes are still present. But what we've done is we've basically changed their positions. So if we had a gene now being moved basically to the opposite end of that entire section, it could be far too far from its regulatory region for its expression to happen normally. So it can interfere with the expression of certain genes due to changing the location of the gene versus the regulatory region for it. Option three, translocation. So a bit of chromosome breaks off in this case. And this time, because it's translocating, it's going somewhere else. It's going to attach to another chromosome. We then have duplication. And this is where we have a section of chromosome being duplicated. Now, if we're duplicating a piece of chromosome, what we're going to end up with is an overexpression of certain genes. So we're going to have more copies of that gene than we should in the organism. The final one, non-disjunction, this is where our pair of chromosomes or chromatids are going to fail to separate during this process of meiosis. And as a result of that failure to separate, then we end up with a zygote with this additional chromosome. So I think Down syndrome is a good example of non-disjunction there. What I've given you at the bottom are just two terms that we should be aware of and their definitions. So aneuploidy, which is where the chromosome number is not an exact multiple of the haploid number for the organism, and polyploidy, where the diploid gamete is fertilized by a haploid gamete, so we end up with a triploid zygote. Alternatively, two diploid gametes fuse, and we make a tetraploid zygote. So what does all of this mean then? 
So if we start off with the aneuploidy first of all, the chromosome number is not an exact multiple of the haploid number of the organism. Let's use humans. Haploid number for humans is 23. We have 46 chromosomes in our body cells, which is the diploid number. Haploid number, half of that, 23 chromosomes. Now, if we end up with our final organism, where we're going to have Down syndrome, for example, then what's happened is we've inherited an extra chromosome 21. So what we find is that in that final offspring, we end up with 47 chromosomes. That's not a multiple of 23. So it's aneuploidy. Polyploidy, this is where we've got our diploid gamete. So remember, di meaning two. And that's going to be fertilized by a haploid gamete. So obviously haploid refers to half. So we end up with a triploid zygote. Tri meaning three. So again, in our case here, we would have, say, 46 in one, our diploid, 23 in the haploid gamete. And when they form together, obviously, we're just going to add 46 to 23. So that would be 69. OK, alternatively, if we've got two diploid gametes fusing to make a tetraploid, tetra just means four. So basically two diploid and di meaning two. So obviously we're then adding an extra two sets of our chromosomes. We also need to consider what happens in sexual reproduction itself, because this is another key source of genetic variation. Now, what we hopefully remember from our earlier work about meiosis is that we end up with these four genetically different gametes as that final point of meiosis. And we get variation in those four gametes. They are genetically different after all. The reason we get that variation there is we get a selection of events occurring at specific phases. And the key thing here, because obviously meiosis does go through these twice, the numbers are important. So don't just go writing metaphase and leave it like that. You would need to be more specific with your language, making sure that you are referring to the correct metaphase, the correct anaphase, etc. So first way that we get variation is allele shuffling. Now, allele shuffling happens during prophase one in that process of crossing over where we are getting those parts of the chromosomes exchanged with each other. So prophase one crossing over leads to allele shuffling. The second way this happens is during metaphase one or anaphase one. And this is where we get the independent assortment of chromosomes. So what we find there is obviously the chromosomes are going to line up along the equator of the cell, but how they line up is completely random. Therefore, independent assortment of them. And this is during metaphase or anaphase one. We then get independent assortment of and go careful here, the chromatids. And this is going to occur in metaphase two or anaphase two. So chromosomes in metaphase one or anaphase one, chromatids in metaphase two or anaphase two. Just go careful with the terminology when you come to write your answers for these. We then also have the completely random fusion of gametes at that point of fertilization. So even when we've made all these individual gametes, then it's again literally a game of chance as to which sperm fertilizes which egg, which pollen grain fertilizes the egg. It's all just a game of chance there. So that random fusion of gametes leads to yet more genetic diversity within our population. The next category is the environmental variation. So what we find here is that if you've got variation caused by the environment, these will not be passed on to the offspring. So you can think about anything that is purely environmental, your accent, if you've got scars, if you've got tattoos, if you've tragically lost a limb or anything like this, that's just you. You're not going to pass that on to your offspring. I'm sure many of us are glad that we will not inherit parents' tattoos, etc., because they're not always our cup of tea, let's be honest. So what we end up with here changes to the organism, but they will not be passed to the offspring. Environmental only. The 
final category are these that are actually influenced by both the genetic factors and environmental factors interacting with those genes. So what we have is this combination of both genes and the environment. Given you two examples there, so one you probably encountered at GCSE, height in humans. If your family are six foot odd giants, then you've got a genetic predisposition to be tall too. However, if when you are very young, no one feeds you a good diet with plenty of protein, for example, you're just not going to get to that maximum height. You're going to be a bit shorter. So clearly we've got our genetics from the family. We then also have the environmental from your diet there. Those two things coming together to then give you your final height that you will eventually reach. To give you an example in plants, because we can't ever forget plants in biology, then we have this condition called chlorosis in plants. So what happens here is if the plant is kept in dim light after germination, then the leaves that develop are going to be yellow. And that's all down to the fact that they don't have sufficient chlorophyll. So we've got the genotype in our plant to make the chlorophyll. So they have the ability there. They've got the genes that tell them how to do this. But because there's no light at that point of germination and just after it, then those genes are not going to be expressed. So basically, even though the genes are there, they're not going to actually be expressed and therefore we will not make the chlorophyll that is required. Hopefully you found this video useful and as always, don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you can see when we next update with a new video.